What's up guys, John the Morgyle here, gonna do a video response to Globetard, Ron Johnson. So, I hope all you guys are having a blessed day on the static plane Earth. Let's just jump right on into it, cause this one has got some shit coming. Firstly, everyone should be aware that the Flat Earth appears in the Illuminati card game, and it's there because it's a massive psyop. A couple of my subscribers have complained that I interrupt my uh, response videos too much, and I, I am sorry, but this is the most efficient, effective way for me to respond to the claims made in such videos, as they are done in sort of a rapid-fire succession so that people don't really have a chance to think about them much. Uh, but I just wanted to address that, that I did hear at least two people uh, make this sort of, uh, you know, constructive criticism on the Neil deGrasse video, which I did recently. I'll put a card right here, uh, in case you haven't seen it. But, um, you know, the only other way I know to do this would be to, like, list out the claims made by the uh, Globetard here, and then do all of my rebuttals at the end. But, you know, it would sort of be out of context, and this is the, you know, best way that I know how to do it in order to keep the rebuttals in context. So, in terms of the claim made by the Globetard here, um, he's essentially saying that Flat Earth is a PSYOP, and the proof is that it is in the Illuminati card game. Now, the card actually says Flat Earthers may know something. Da -da 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 -da. and it's considered a fringe group in the game. I've never played the game. I've never really been into, uh, you know, childish things like that. Some people may be, but yeah, I was not like a Pokemon kid or, you know, a garbage pail card kid or whatever. I don't know. I never even really got into comics, but, you know, to say that something being an Illuminati card game proves that it's a PSYOP, uh, is really quite ridiculous. I suppose that we can conclude that NASA is faking space and faking the uh, very Apollo missions and the blue marble sort of uh, Earth in the background there based on your theory that the Illuminati card game is somehow an infallible source of truth. Sure, there do seem to be some sort of eerie predictions that you can uh, possibly connect dots to and see that they've occurred in the future but you know things like oil spill and terrorist attack and gas attack and you know these aren't things that were totally 100 percent fabricated i mean these are known threats these are known things that happen now whether or not the elite are using this game as a playbook whether the playbook is prophetic or it could be you know some pretty serious coincidences in a lot of cases. I mean, I have seen some things in the Illuminati card game that really do sort of make you scratch your head and wonder how they could have gotten certain things really quite technically uh, accurate to what's occurred in reality uh, beyond the possibility of sheer coincidence. Which leads me to believe, you know, there may be some rich, powerful people playing this game, or it could be somewhat prophetic. Um, anyway, I'm not going to, you know, hold too much weight on something that is on an Illuminati card because, you know, unfortunately, Ron Johnson, and I'm sorry for calling you a globetard, that was rude, the, the sad fact is the Earth isn't a spinning sphere, and this has been proven, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different ways. Um, furthermore, all physical experiments that you can do in order to prove whether or not the Earth is spherical and spinning and orbiting and all of that, um, all of the, the such experiments come back with results that are null. In other words, the Earth is a stationary plane. Quite the contrary to a spinning sphere, in fact. Truthers play the 9-11 truth card while the Illuminati plays the flat earth card, effectively dividing those attempting to resist the tyranny. The Illuminati plays the flat earth game? What kind of ridiculous shit is that, man? The Illuminati plays the flat earth game. Okay, the earth happens to be a stationary plane. 
if you can prove curvature and axial rotation, then you can debunk the flat earth. Until then, you have nothing and your arguments are just so far in the realm of skullduggery, it's preposterous. Furthermore, if you can disprove the data on the Facebook page, $5,000 NASA Eclipse Challenge, then guess what? You can win 5000 bucks. All you have to do is disprove the uh, data that is cataloged very easily to understand by uh, my friend Brian, who's a civil engineer. Unfortunately, it's been up for over a year now and nobody's been able to claim the prize because unfortunately you can't debunk facts and this is just, you know, yet another fact involving solar and lunar eclipses that are physically impossible on a spherical Earth model and jive perfectly with a flat Earth reality. Just like everything else, if you would bother to open your eyes to the truth, if for no other reason than for argument's sake, it's not going to hurt you or kill you to humor theories that happen to differ from your accepted paradigm. In fact, the only outcome to such bizarre behavior that is essentially the scientific method is to further understand the truth, if not by process of elimination, but by confirming what you already know to be true, or what you already think you know to be true. Before continuing, we would just like you to accept the fact that there is a Flat Earth card in the Illuminati card deck, and that other explanations for what is being observed are possible. For example, this clip from ODD TV. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. Unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Multiple government outlets have leaked this information on purpose because they want you to follow the breadcrumbs back to the outlets that cover this propaganda. Wait a minute, so you're insinuating that the government wants to get caught stealing $20 billion a year just in tax dollars for NASA? You're insinuating that NASA wants to get caught faking space and faking the moon landings, which indeed they have been 100% certainly? <sighs> In this clip, you heard exactly what they wanted you to hear. And in these other clips, you're seeing exactly what they want you to see. And while it points towards mass deception, what it might suggest is mass deflection. You're making absolutely no sense. And I don't care how much scary music you play in the background and use big words and seemingly profound statements that make really absolutely no sense whatsoever. That doesn't score any points uh, with anybody who's really looking into this logically, I would hope. There are no accidents in politics. That's poli sci 101. NASA has nothing to do with politics. NASA is an arm of the US military. It is a government agency, but it is not political in the slightest, other than the fact that they do get US tax dollars, right? But to claim that NASA wants to be caught faking space and is going to do anything but continue deceiving people and as cheaply as possible, they really don't have to try that hard, to be honest. They've got an extremely large budget to do this sort of thing with, 
but most people already believe everything NASA says, including really quite ridiculous animations of the moon from a million miles away or whatever like you're seeing here. But NASA is completely dead in the water because they've been caught red-handed uh, lying, faking spacewalks, faking interiors of the ISS, and this isn't some sort of breadcrumb trail. This is researchers catching NASA uh, filming spacewalks in underwater pools. Other evidence that you'll see on ODD and the like includes video footage from the edge of the atmosphere showing what appears to be a flat world. The truth of the matter is that given the size of the planet, you would have to be much further away from the Earth to see the curvature than these weather experiments can provide. Really, is that so? And is that why globe heads claim that they can see ships going over the horizon in just a few miles? What about when you get over 100,000 feet in altitude and the horizon level doesn't drop, as it should where the Earth is sphere? Why can we see that the sun is clearly local, casting a hot spot directly on the clouds beneath it? That should not happen if the sun was 93 million miles away. The simple fact is, is, high altitude shots should indeed show curvature. Globeheads even argue they can see curvature from the top of a mountain or out of a plane window, but you're saying that from over 100,000 feet that, that isn't high enough. Although, standing at sea level, you claim to be able to see ships going over the horizon. Now, of course, ships going over the horizon is an operation of perspective, has nothing to do with going over a curve, and you'll probably have to uh, watch some of my older videos or plenty of other uh, Flat Earthers videos going into the operations of perspective and how that makes distant objects obviously appear to get smaller and smaller, more so the closer they are to your line of sight. So, the top of a mast of a ship is more distant from your line of sight than the hull, therefore it will be visible for a longer period beyond the horizon line, and it will appear to continue to get smaller and smaller as it goes beyond your uh, horizon line. That gives the optical illusion of it going over a curve, however if you zoom back in on the very same ship that has appeared to go over the horizon or merge with the horizon bottom first, and zoom in on it, you will clearly see the entire ship restored. If the Earth is 8,000 miles wide, and if the best independent footage of the Earth is only at about 5 miles away, that means the ratio is 5 divided by 8,000. You have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. First of all, I'm familiar with one extremely well-known amateur photograph and footage of the Chicago skyline from nearly 60 miles away. So that is quite a bit more distant than five miles away, as you've claimed. Uh, however, to say that the Earth is 8,000 miles wide and five miles or 60 miles is a small fraction of that, and you can just sort of divide that into the total to make your point, although we're dealing with spherical trigonometry here, so it's a little bit more complex than simple division, although it's really not that complex. Uh, we should expect to see eight inches per mile squared in terms of vertical descent due to curvature. So, when you're talking about a distance of, say, 50 or 60 miles, then the base of the buildings across this body of water should be at nearly a quarter mile beneath, or actually over a quarter mile, beneath the horizon line, uh, meaning you shouldn't be able to see even the tip tops of the tallest buildings from this distance. However, we can clearly see pretty much the entire building, right? And so this proves that the Earth doesn't have the curvature needed. Um, your claim that five miles or even 60 miles being not that much of a fraction of the Earth's distance is irrelevant as the face of any water in any flat plain area of the Earth should be a perfect curve. Really, it, it honestly should be. And that curvature simply doesn't exist. 
or .000625. If you apply that ratio to the globe that you're used to seeing in your school, which is about a foot wide, that means your camera would be .0075 inches off the surface of the globe, or 0.19 millimeters. That means you would place your camera at that distance and point it at the globe, like you're using a microscope, and then wonder to yourself, why does it look flat? Everything looks flat at that perspective. Test it out for yourself. We're not talking about whether or not this looks flat. We're talking about whether or not the Earth is indeed curved or not. So, you really have to look into this a little bit more deeply because you can't really apply this to a globe. The scale's way too small. You can only apply this to the actual Earth itself and not by using some cockamamie division that you're trying to use to prove a point. You have to actually go by the pretty basic curvature calculator that you see here. Um, yeah, have to subtract your height above sea level, which does uh, that does affect the equation heavily. Um, if you're six feet above sea level, then your horizon line is about three and a half miles away, uh, meaning your line of sight would become a tangent to the curve of the Earth expectedly after a distance of three and a half miles. Uh, however, if you were, say, up 100,000 feet in a weather balloon, then the distance to your apparent horizon, your ground horizon, is obviously going to be far greater uh, field of view than compared to someone standing six feet tall. But even then, even in the ISS, uh, if you look at a basketball, the ISS would be like a quarter inch above the, uh, or less, above the surface of the basketball to put that into scale. So, you know, the claim that you have to be in space to see or detect or measure the curvature of the Earth is ridiculous, and the fact that you gloss over this with a claim based on ignorance doesn't help your argument whatsoever. But surely that will not convince the most hardened believers. What about the pictures you've seen that show objects that should be hidden by the curvature of the Earth? Yeah, what about that? You're showing pictures of buildings that are 37 miles away, when just a moment ago you said... The best independent footage of the Earth is only at about 5 miles away. So what is it? Is it 5 miles away? 37 miles away? Almost 60 miles away? Maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but that appears that you're either totally not of sound mind, or you're being disingenuous, or, or maybe there's just some huge misunderstanding here, giving you the benefit of the doubt. Objects that should be hidden by the curvature of the Earth, like in this image here. Well, we do see curvature in those pictures, just not as much as they say. And so if the curvature is less, that means the Earth is bigger than they say. That is among the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. You're saying that the Earth doesn't possess the curvature that it should, yet it doesn't possess any curvature whatsoever, and the fact that the bottoms of those buildings are covered up has to do with the operations of perspective. Again, the bottoms of the buildings are beyond your visual horizon line, and so the bottoms of the buildings will appear to merge with the horizon prior to the tops of the buildings, even upon a plane. Now, humoring your argument for just a moment here, the argument that the Earth may be bigger than we're told, uh, falsifies the heliocentric model, if you aren't aware of that. Um, the heliocentric model relies on all of the mathematics involved to be 100% accurate. So, for example, if the Earth was much bigger than they say, then the heliocentric model doesn't work because all of that is uh, figured up to a T. Uh, we have 24-hour days, um, obviously, which means the Earth is spinning at a given speed. Now, that given speed has allegedly been confirmed by science, which is 1,037 and a half miles per hour at the equator. Of course, any physical experiments you can do to try to prove this axial rotation, supersonic axial rotation, no less, at the equator, in the tropics, and even in the United States, it would be well beyond the sound barrier. But the way that they figure all this up is based on the given size of the Earth. Now, if the Earth was much bigger than we're told, then none of this math, none of these mathematical figures would work. Um, 
NASA's missions to space wouldn't work and they would have you know obviously figured out that the numbers were wrong and this would also prove if the earth was much bigger than we're told that the original observations of Eratosthenes back in ancient Greece measuring or allegedly measuring the earth using the very high technology that the ancient Greeks had being a hole in the ground and a stick in the ground that that's how they triangulated on the sun back way back when in ancient Greece and they use those very same numbers to estimate the size of the earth which by the way has quote unquote been uh, confirmed by modern science and according to them Eratosthenes was uh, very very accurate in his measurement so even if you know what you're saying is true which it isn't then that would prove that the entire construct of the heliocentric model is fallacious and it would also prove that NASA and science have been lying. Now furthermore, even if the Earth was 10 times larger than what we're told, there would still be a measurable vertical descent due to curvature and unfortunately this still isn't measured. Um, any sort of measurements that you think you're getting in terms of the bottoms of buildings or the bottoms of ships disappearing uh, has to do yet again with perspective as well as atmospheric uh, distortion uh, when you're dealing with ships at sea especially. The first explorers that went to Antarctica after World War II have said as much, that there's a continent the size of America on the other side of Antarctica. Which is physically impossible if the Earth was a globe with the given proportions. And the given proportions would be, you know, 8,000 mile radius sphere. The person you're referring to is Admiral Richard E. Byrd during Operation High Jump in the 1940s. He actually found during uh, Operation High Jump when he flew his plane well south of the South Pole, he said that he found a continental landmass larger than America. So if there's a continent south of the South Pole, then mariners would have found it a uh, long time ago, you would think. Now, I am under the impression that there may be some land hidden in the vast Pacific Ocean, right in the middle of it. Although, you know, I can't prove it, and I'm not going to say that Flat Earth Truth relies on such land being hidden in the vast uh, Pacific Ocean, where, you know, if you look at a globe, it's that huge area where there's nothing but water. And the reason I think that that may be the case is because uh, mariners of centuries past would have probably been taking east and west routes when they were circumnavigating the world, which is not exclusive to a sphere. You can, uh, for example, go around the North Pole, uh, which is in the center of the flat Earth, according to the azimuthal equidistant projection. And so they would have been following the stars and following compasses in order to maintain their courses. And um, it appears that those may have been actually great arcs along the flat Earth. Please keep in mind that the AE projection is not a model, it is a projection of the Earth. And the outer areas, especially beyond the equator, as you see on this uh, red line here, uh, that area would be skewed in terms of the distances involved with such an east-to-west route described by that red line there. And so, although east and west would be right angles to north and south in the AE sort of scenario where the north is in the center, and that does make a lot of sense, you know, also looking at things like Polaris and uh, observations of that from anywhere uh, in the northern hemisphere will find uh, Polaris visible in the north. And so, although the distances are skewed in the AE projection, uh, it is still a viable way to describe flat Earth, although we do need a better map than this. Uh, Mercator projection has similar flaws to it, where the top and bottom of the map is skewed to infinity, 
and of course the AE projection, the outermost area of the map is skewed to infinity. And so again, the distances shown here are exaggerated, uh, especially in the southern hemisphere. And of course, the more direct route nowadays would be a cord to those great uh, arcs on the flat earth. And so there's a fairly large area of ocean that, you know, may be unexplored. It's possible, and there may be land there. Now, in terms of what's beyond the known earth, uh, the flat earth probably doesn't have an edge, to be very honest. Um, for those of you who are new to this, it's not like we're floating around in space. Uh, space doesn't actually exist. So, you can't really bring any heliocentric premises or infinite space premises to flat earth. And so, since we're obviously not floating around in space, the earth is stationary, um, the idea of an edge to it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Although, if you're looking at it from sort of a biblical perspective, it may be on pillars, although there is no real evidence of what's far beyond the outer edges of where the sun don't shine. So if you go far enough south, eventually you will get to a place where the sun is not visible ever, and nobody's ever been that far on the flat earth. And since access has been restricted since the discovery, surely it is plausible to question the size of the Earth. Yes, but only if you have absolutely no understanding of the heliocentric model and how it is necessarily so intricately defined and allegedly proven to be its exact shape and size and velocity and rotational speed and everything necessarily and if any of that sort of thing is shown to be off or non-existent then the entire model doesn't work so in other words if the earth is shown to be stationary which it has um, using countless numbers of experiments and some of them you can even do at home we won't get into that now, but if the Earth is shown to be stationary, then the heliocentric model doesn't work. If the Earth is shown to be much, much larger, which it absolutely has not, but if you were to somehow prove that, then all of the science that NASA purports would be way off. The days would be way off. Now, we know exactly how wide around the Earth is at the equator, and since we know that a day lasts 24 hours, then the velocity of the equator, according to the heliocentric model, is 1,037 and a half miles per hour towards the east. And so that is all theoretical. It's figured up assuming that the Earth is a sphere, but these distances and the rates of celestial bodies prove conclusively that one or the other thing is spinning. So either the Earth is spinning or the celestial lights are spinning, or possibly the ether and the magnetic fields in between our eye and the light source is spinning and everything's stationary, but um, it's got to be one of those. And unfortunately, if it is indeed the Earth that is not spinning and is stationary and anything else is what's doing the spinning, then the Earth is proven to be a stationary object which falsifies the heliocentric model but the point is is that if the earth was a sphere and it was much much bigger then the measurements of the equator would be way off and the measurements of the equator can be verified and that's what's used to assume the lines of uh, latitude and longitude so the ultimate point is, is if you're entertaining the notion that the Earth may be much, much larger than what we're told, then you're willing to entertain the notion that science has gotten the entire heliocentric model wrong. Because, again, if the Earth is a ball, it must necessarily be 4,000 miles in radius. So the idea of questioning the size of the Earth is really quite irrelevant because the Earth as a globe must be exactly the size that they say it is or none of the rest of the model works. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying.
But what about the planes that seem to disappear from Flight Radar 24 as they cross the Pacific or Indian Oceans? Flight Radar 24 isn't getting their data from air traffic control. They receive information from private citizens using transponder kits that plug into their internet, like a radio scanner for planes. And since no one can contribute a private radio scanner in the middle of the Pacific, well, it becomes a blackout zone for websites and a hotbed for conspiracy theories so what is that even supposed to mean so uh airplanes fly off of civilian tracking capabilities over the pacific ocean therefore the earth is a spinning sphere um in order to prove the earth isn't flat then you need to prove curvature of the earth and you also need to prove that the earth is spinning on its axis over a thousand miles an hour near the equator. I honestly don't think poking holes in some sort of ridiculous arguments for the flat earth is necessarily going to prove anything at all, except that proponents for certain proofs need to be a little bit more careful when calling things proofs. Because the fact that we can't see airplanes on civilian-based website tracking as they go over the Pacific Ocean doesn't prove anything one way or another. Now, it can be construed as a little bit fishy, and it can be construed to support the notion of a flat Earth, but it 100% does not prove anything uh, in terms of the curvature or axial rotation of the Earth one way or another. And poking holes in such an argument with, you know, the weaponized term of the Tavistock Institute conspiracy theory, uh, you try to discredit the entire truth that the Earth is in fact a stationary plane. However, you're doing an extremely poor job of it. But wait, there's more. Recently, we were trolled by deep inside the rabbit hole. The guy was begging for a confrontation, so we reached out and politely brought up these cold, hard facts. And unsurprisingly, we were met with a tantrum of profanity. And so we're going to spend a few minutes addressing some of the content they support when it comes to Flat Earth and the like. Yes, I'm sure you were extremely polite and factual to David Weiss. I'm sure you were extremely polite and factual to him. And let's just listen to this alleged profanity you're speaking of. So you're in an airplane and you and uh, you're moving. Let's well, let's call it you're moving uh, 300 miles an hour before you even start taking off. You know, it, it, through space, you take off and you fly down to the equator and you head um, to the west. To the west, you head to the you head to the east. Okay. Um, with, you know, you're going with the spin of the Earth. Well, the Earth is going a thousand miles per hour. The, the plane accelerated 500 miles an hour. So let's add the 200 that you're already moving. Now you're going 700 miles an hour. You flown to the equator, but the Earth is moving over a thousand miles an hour. How come you're not going backwards? May I'll tell you this: it makes me feel kind of silly that I ever believed the Earth was round. That is just the beginning. Oh, okay, so you're just claiming that he used a firestorm of profanity against you, and you're playing a clip of him on a whole nother thing altogether. Now, I know David Weiss personally, and I'm 100% positive that he probably wouldn't cuss you out under any circumstances, uh, especially if you approached him politely and with factual evidence, um, however, I would suspect that even if you were extremely rude and impolite and just coming at him with a bunch of globe-tarted nonsense, he still wouldn't, you know, hit you with a firestorm or whatever of profanity. But uh, anyway, that's a really good point that he just made about the airplanes. Uh, westbound flights should absolutely be shorter duration flights than their respective eastbound flights. And one of the things that you need to keep in mind that he mentioned that you failed to uh, even consider was that this plane and this hypothetical flight started from a northerly location, headed south from that point, and then began to head uh, east. So it's not starting from the same frame of reference as the latitude where it's going to head east from, meaning it 
it would not have the momentum lent to an you know, eastbound plane taking off from a similar latitude and would therefore need to catch up with the frame of reference with the ground beneath, which is impossible. Uh, this is something that is really quite obvious because if the Earth was a spinning sphere, then every destination would be racing east. And since airplanes travel independent of the ground and fly under their own propulsion, then westbound planes would absolutely not retain their eastbound reference or their eastbound frame of reference velocity as they did when the tires were still planted firmly on the runway. And so indeed, what we see is that westbound flights and eastbound flights say from New York to LA and back the duration is often identical which is physically impossible on a spinning spherical earth and in fact such identical duration flights let alone even remotely similar duration flights would be impossible on a spinning spherical earth because of basic common sense physics the Earth spins once per day, which means that if you live at the equator, the surface of the Earth with you on it is moving around a thousand miles per hour to the east. According to your preposterous theory, assuming we are spinning at all. Relative to the center of the Earth. Even at 45 degrees latitude, the Earth's surface is moving 700 miles per hour to the east, so it kind of seems like it should be faster for airplanes to fly west. I mean, their destination is literally spinning towards them. At the same time, however, they are spinning away from their destination. You, my friend, are an idiot and you have no idea what you're talking about. If the Earth was spinning and the plane was spinning a uh, thousand miles per hour towards the east near the equator, that plane would be spinning with the Earth towards the east prior to takeoff. However, when the plane takes off into the air and begins to propel itself west under its own propulsion, its own guidance, independent of the face of the allegedly spinning Earth, then it could not possibly continue spinning towards the east. One of the fundamental laws of motion, really, again, very common sense physics, is the fact that an object in motion will tend to maintain its velocity until enacted upon by some other force. And of course, we can consider several jet engines attached to an airplane as some other force. Now, globetards tend to argue that the atmosphere is somehow magically attached to the face of the spinning Earth, which is really also quite ridiculous, although even giving them that for argument's sake, if that was true, then such westbound flights would encounter, as a rule, extremely high velocity headwinds approaching over a thousand miles an hour. Now, I've mentioned this before, but the fastest winds ever recorded were about 302 miles per hour in a tornado. Uh, furthermore, westbound flights do not, absolutely do not, encounter headwinds, super velocity headwinds at that, as a rule, nor do eastbound flights encounter super velocity tailwinds as a rule. In fact, a plane may have headwinds or tailwinds, regardless of its direction of travel, depending on weather conditions. When we say the Earth is going a thousand miles per hour to the east, that means that the ground, and airplanes on the ground, and even the air above the ground are all also moving a thousand miles per hour to the east. Really, and please explain how it's possible for the atmosphere to remain tattooed to the velocity of the ground beneath it. For one thing, uh, the further you gain in altitude, assuming the Earth is a spinning sphere, then the further distance the atmosphere would have to travel. Proportionally with altitude, the distance would increase due to that little molecule of atmosphere having to travel across a larger arc than something fixed to the ground. Now, furthermore, nowhere in reality can you demonstrate this thousand mile per hour wind that is tattooed to the earth as a rule. Um, and again, we can tell this because when you take a plane off and propel yourself towards the west, that plane is no longer attached to the frame of reference with the ground. 
the instant the tires leave the runway and the, be the plane begins to accelerate at high velocities towards the west, it should begin to encounter, as a rule, extreme high velocity headwinds, although it still would be traveling towards the destination, while the destination would be traveling at super high velocities towards the nose of the plane. Therefore, westbound flights should be extremely short flights comparatively with their return flights due to the fact that the plane is designed to be aerodynamic, meaning it is designed to go directly through air with as little drag as possible. This would allow for westbound planes to arrive at their destinations, taking advantage of the destination spinning towards the nose of the plane at supersonic velocities as the plane cuts through the hell of a headwind that doesn't exist and reaches its destination much more quickly than a plane heading back towards the east the same distance. And of course we can clearly see that such flights are often identical in duration and what's even funnier is sometimes you'll find the eastbound flights are shorter, maybe 15 or 30 minutes shorter than the westbound flights. And of course, that's the exact opposite of what you'd expect if the Earth and all the destinations were spinning towards the east, regardless of whether or not the atmosphere is tattooed to the face of the Earth, which it isn't. That's ridiculous. For an airplane to get anywhere, it has to start moving relative to the ground and through the air at something like 100 or so miles per hour. So when it flies east, it's actually moving a thousand plus a hundred miles an hour to the east. And when it flies west, it's actually moving a thousand minus a hundred miles an hour to the east. Yes, to go west, you go east, just slower than the earth is going east. Do you even realize how ridiculous you sound? Do you actually think that an airplane traveling through the air on its own propulsion, on its own guidance, independent of the Earth, would actually continue racing towards the east as it accelerates west? Even if you're granted the ridiculous notion that the atmosphere is tattooed to the face of the Earth, then the westbound plane would still be accelerating in the opposite direction as the spin of the Earth. Now, if you've ever studied even elementary levels of physics, you'll know that this is physically impossible. Again, even giving you the plane traveling east as it's fixed to the runway, uh, when it takes off and heads west, that would end very abruptly. Now in terms of the eastbound plane, uh, you've even got that wrong truly because granting you all of the same things for argument's sake, as the plane begins to waste energy in terms of ascending high into the air and banking and doing anything but accelerating towards the east, it would begin to slip out of the rotational velocity with the ground uh, by the fact that it's traveling across a greater arc, but also by the fact that it is no longer connected to the ground anymore, which is traveling over a thousand miles an hour. That's the ground. Now, even if the plane is traveling east and heads east, it's not going to retain all of the momentum that was merely lent to it by the face of the Earth, assuming that the Earth is spinning at all. That plane would begin to, like I said, waste energy, waste its momentum in ascending miles into the air and even doing banks to get its course correct, and it would begin to slip out of that eastward frame of reference, and indeed the race between the nose of the plane and the destination would begin. Now, the fact that uh, two flights, one west, one returning east, are often identical in duration debunks the idea that the Earth is a spinning sphere, even if I were to grant you that an eastbound flight would not be slipping out of its eastward velocity as it wastes energy ascending. The simple truth is the westbound flight would absolutely be racing towards the eastbound destinations, meaning they would meet in the middle far more quickly than the eastbound flight could ever catch up to the eastbound destination. This is simple common sense 101 elementary physics and you're trying to explain something that you obviously haven't thought through. You assume that the Earth is a sphere and that all observations must occur on a spinning sphere and so you're going to try to back engineer this really quite excellent proof that the Earth isn't spinning 
by using ignorance and illogic in order to patch together your paradigm so that you can continue on with your cognitive dissonance. Unless you're within 10 or so miles of the poles, in which case a brisk westward walk will take you legitimately west. That said, planes do often take different amounts of time to fly the same route in different directions. That is completely irrelevant because such flights often take the exact same identical duration at least some of the time, totally falsifying any notion of axial rotation. Again, a westbound flight should be far swifter than an eastbound flight due to the fact that all destinations are racing towards the east, and hence the plane acting as a free agent independent of the spinning earth, propelling itself west with jet engines using an aerodynamic frame completely on its own propulsion, on its own volition and accord, independent of the spinning spherical earth that only exists in your imagination but has nothing to do with physical reality in the slightest. Because of winds in the upper atmosphere like the jet stream that they either have at their tail or have to fly into. Okay, so this is a major contradiction in your very own words. Uh, let's pull up what you said just a few minutes ago in this video and compare it to what you just said now. Do you really have that short of an attention span? Seriously. Let's flash back and we'll get the whole harp thing going and everything to about 30 seconds ago. Ignorance is bliss. When we say the Earth is going a thousand miles per hour to the east, that means that the ground, and airplanes on the ground, and even the air above the ground are all also moving a thousand miles per hour to the east. So you're saying that the Earth, and the air, and the high altitude air that is right up against the vacuum of space, held there by the weak force of gravity that has not been attributed to behaving as a solid barrier to separate a vacuum from a pressurized system, but anyway, let's compare this to what you just said again. Because of winds in the upper atmosphere like the jet stream that they either have at their tail or have to fly into. So which is it, you confused globe head? Is it... Even the air above the ground moving a thousand miles per hour to the east. Or is it... Winds that they either have at their tail or have to fly into. Because you seriously can't have it both ways. Uh, either the atmosphere is fixed to the ground beneath it, traveling a thousand miles an hour to the east, or the atmosphere is not fixed to the ground beneath it, allowing for either headwinds or tailwinds depending on the direction of travel. And again, the way that we know for sure that the air is not fixed above a spinning spherical Earth is because, again, westbound flights would always, as a rule, face headwinds, and eastbound flights would always, as a rule, face tailwinds. The fact is, is that... Um, the winds aloft can be taken advantage of going in either direction if you can find the right jet streams. But those jet streams are good proof that the air is not fixed to the spinning earth. Even the air above the ground moving a thousand miles per hour to the east. Winds that they either have at their tail or have to fly into. When we say the earth is going a thousand miles per hour to the east, that means that the ground and airplanes on the ground and even the air above the ground are all also moving a thousand miles per hour to the east. The planes do often take different amounts of time to fly the same route in different directions. Because of winds in the upper atmosphere like the jet stream that they either have at their tail or have to fly into. I want the bullshit! You can't handle the bullshit. Bullshit. The prevailing direction of these winds is largely caused by the Coriolis effect, which is caused by the fact that different parts of the Earth are moving east at different speeds, which happens because the Earth is round and spinning. Yet again, you are 100% wrong. The Coriolis effect has nothing to do with the counter-rotational velocities of cyclonic forces in either hemisphere. If that was the case, you would necessarily see the dividing line between the two cyclonic forces strictly fixed to the equator, and yet what happens instead is that dividing line appears to follow the sun during its seasonal pass from Capricorn to Cancer and back over the course of a year. 
unfortunately, there is a much more sensible explanation for how the rotational velocities of cyclonic forces changes whether it's north or south of the pass of the sun during that portion of the season. And so what happens is, is the sun, as it passes overhead through the atmosphere, which behaves as a liquid on the macroscopic level, perturbs the atmosphere out and away from the front of the sun's path, sort of exciting and pushing the atmosphere out and away from the center of the sun's path, essentially pushing this liquid north and south of the sun, much like you would see uh, rowing an oar through the water or cupping a hand and running it through a bathtub full of water, you will always see such cyclonic forces if you get the uh, force just right. But this is one of the fundamental principles of fluid dynamics and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the spin of the earth because, well, the earth isn't spinning. And furthermore, the Coriolis effect itself debunks your whole claim that the atmosphere is fixed to the rotational velocity of the Earth. Um, if that was the case, then technically the Coriolis effect shouldn't apply to the atmosphere because, well, according to you, the atmosphere is always adherent or tattooed, uh, more or less, to the ground beneath it. So you couldn't possibly really have any sort of weather patterns in the grand scheme of things if your theory is correct, which it obviously is very, very far from correct and is in fact in the realm of ludicrousness. So airplane travel times are influenced by the rotation of the Earth. You are such a liar! If airplane travel times were affected by the rotation of the Earth, then westbound flights would be a breeze. Uh, you know, they wouldn't, it wouldn't hardly take but maybe two and a half, three hours to fly from New York to L.A. Uh, however, eastbound flights should at least be way longer than that, if not technically physically impossible on a spinning spherical Earth due to all of the things that I've already mentioned. Independent of whether or not the atmosphere is velcroed to the Earth. Again, airplanes are designed to be aerodynamic, so the weather really doesn't play that big of a factor when you're talking about axial rotation exceeding a thousand miles per hour. So as you can see, speed is relative to the rotation of the Earth. Everything on Earth is traveling at the same relative speed, so it feels and looks like we're stationary. You know, you may have a point right up until the time when the airplane takes off from the run runway and heads west. You cannot possibly think, by any stretch of the imagination, that a westbound uh, airplane accelerating to hundreds of miles per hour west could possibly retain its eastward velocity for any duration whatsoever. An object that accelerates independently of the host body being the Earth will simply not maintain such a rotational eastbound frame of reference under no circumstances whatsoever except in your little imagination where you cannot comprehend the fact that the Earth is actually stationary and the flight times prove it. And it's for that reason that we don't feel the dynamics of the rotation of the Earth, because speed and acceleration are constant. So if you think of Earth like traveling in a cruise ship on cruise control, then you can start relating things in a more scientific and accurate way. You say speed and acceleration are constant? Uh, in order for your whole little statement here to work, there should be no acceleration. That's the only way that you can possibly be stuck to a massive body like the Earth or even a you know, smaller body like a train or a plane and not notice that you're moving at high velocities as if you are not accelerating. So if you're in a train going 50 miles an hour perfectly straight without hitting any bumps, then that would represent sort of a uh, linear fixed frame of reference without acceleration. But to say that speed and acceleration are constant is a complete misnomer. I mean, what are you even talking about? Acceleration isn't a constant thing, it's an acceleration. Now, furthermore, the fact that the Earth is allegedly spinning means that we're talking about a curve-linear motion. Now, even if that curve-linear 
rate is consistent, the fact that you're dealing with a nonlinear frame of reference indicates inherently that there would necessarily be an acceleration involved. When you couple that with the fact that the Earth is allegedly orbiting along an elliptical path, then you also have acceleration involved in terms of the alleged path of the Earth. Because if it was moving in a straight line, that would be one thing. However, going around a curve, you would experience constant acceleration. Now, we won't get into solar velocities or galactic velocities, but just with the spinning and orbital motion of the Earth, you've got two major accelerations going on where you as an observer, say, standing near the equator, you would be experiencing the Earth racing up towards your feet at 66,000 miles an hour. Now, 12 hours later, at sunset, in the equinox, uh, you would experience the Earth racing away from your feet at 66,600 miles per hour. This equates to a full spectrum acceleration from one extreme to the other, totaling 130,000 miles per hour in complete acceleration from sunrise to sunset. And your body would experience a constant inertial phase shift from the phrase of re uh, frame of reference of the Earth. This means we should experience constant acceleration from one extreme velocity with the Earth racing up towards your feet at sunrise to another complete opposite extreme velocity uh, where the Earth is racing away from your feet at sunset. Again, a total acceleration of 130,000 miles an hour over a 12-hour period of time. Deep inside, the rabbit hole doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Not only are there arguments for a flat Earth riddled with inaccuracies, they recently slopped together this video on one of Hillary's latest appearances, claiming that she wasn't even there, that it was CGI. The only evidence in their report claims that you couldn't see Hillary on the cell phones recording her. It got 30,000 views and most people liked it. Most people liked it, ladies and gentlemen. When we went back to the source of the footage, it shows us plain as day that you can see Hillary on the cell phones. It's obvious as can be, before and after the speech. Deep inside the rabbit hole peddled it to the public knowing that it was fiction and the people ate it up. We'd like to think that Dave over there at Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole means well and that these problems in his reporting are due to a lack of scientific training. Unfortunately, we suspect that there's a different agenda at play. Now I will say that I saw the press conference that you were showing there, although I had no idea that Deep Inside the rabbit hole did a video on it and you know what's funny is that I noticed the exact same thing there was a lot of those cell phones that were clearly not uh, displaying what was should have been right in their cameras another thing I noticed and I'm not sure the whether Dave caught this as well but these arms like the blue uh, sh the arms in the blue shirt that doesn't appear to belong to anyone and there's all these other arms and actually if you look at the press conference leading up to this point or prior to when Hillary comes out there's hardly any people standing there and certainly none of these many many hands that are being held up those hands don't seem to belong to anyone that was actually standing there so it's almost as if they added in fake you know onlookers just by putting their hands in there and making Hillary seem to be a big deal for these people because they're all, all trying to get a snapshot of her with their cell phones. But really, if you look at it carefully, you're not seeing what should be in these cameras of the cell phones. And many of these sets of outstretched arms don't have any heads or bodies to go with them, especially if you study the video footage from this same angle prior to when Hillary comes walking out on stage as she's about to do right now. And it really appeared, if you watch the entire thing, uh, that it, where she step walks up on stage, and I'm not even talking about Dave's video, I'm not sure if this was included, but when she, I believe she's wearing like a uh, pantsuit, and she walks up on stage, and it really does does appear as if she's not there and not just from the cell phones but there was a few other factors involved but that's sort of irrelevant so uh, essentially I'm not sure where you're going with this but is it safe to say that uh, 
even if Hillary was there at that pre press conference, that it would not add or subtract curvature or axial rotation to the Earth. So essentially you're trying to discredit Dave by taking a very short snippet of his video, probably out of context, from an extremely questionable press conference that Hillary did, uh, it was right, right around the time of the elections if I'm not mistaken, where it really did seem kind of fishy, but at the same time, um, is that scientific proof that the Earth is a spinning sphere? Or is it proof that maybe Dave made a mistake? Or is it proof that maybe you're being disingenuous with the clip that you chose to use and the way that you cut that because some of those cell phones did not show what should have been displayed in them? And I, I actually noticed that myself. It, it wasn't anything that was just that Dave had noticed, apparently, because I noticed it too on that same press conference. Take the Santa Claus, for example. Everybody knows what Santa Claus is an anagram for. Everybody knows that Santa is an anagram for Satan. And the purpose of the Santa Claus is to replace what the Christian Christmas holiday is truly about. It attempts to pull children away from the nativity scene while plunging them into the ideology of consumerism and secularism. This is compounded by the fact that it forces children to believe in something that does not exist, therefore training them to not believe the things and messages associated with Christmas. It's a psyop of the dark side. And this is exactly what is going on with this flat earth propaganda as well wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute now i agree with you about christmas it is definitely a pagan holiday at its very core um, has nothing to do with the birth of jesus christ which probably well almost certainly didn't happen in the winter months and certainly has nothing to do with the winter solstice now on the other hand, to associate Flat Earth with Santa Claus is, first of all, you're stealing my idea uh, for a video that I put out a year ago, and I'll put a card right here. I'm sure you didn't steal the idea, I'm just joking. But Santa Claus analogy only works if you're talking about something that is taught to young children as factual, or it's purported by parents and teachers to young children as being factual when it in fact happens to be false. Now in the case of Santa Claus it is actually a little bit more insidious than the globe because parents and teachers willfully knowingly lie to the children in order to get them to believe something that the parents know full well is complete hogwash. Uh, furthermore, yeah, I agree that we need to celebrate Christmas if you're going to do so in order to remember the birthday of Christ. I mean, that really is what it's at, what it's about at its essence. However, if you're going to take a biblical stance here, which I usually don't argue the Bible, but, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, which that's what it appears to be since you were pointing out the fact that Christmas is a pagan holiday that was supplanted into Christianity by the Roman Catholic Church when Rome co-opted the Christian movement way back when, during the reign of uh, Emperor Constantine at its very roots. So assuming that this means you're a Christian, then you need to really look at the Bible because the Bible is clearly clearly states in many, many, many passages that the earth is fixed and immovable and states that the sun and the moon go in circuits above the face of the earth. And there's even extra biblical texts that go even further. For example, the book of Enoch. At any rate, I really don't like to get into theological or Christian arguments regarding the flat earth because quite frankly the Bible was written in a context when everyone knew the earth was flat and so it wasn't a book written to either prove or disprove the spherical earth. 
obviously it was correct technically and so uh, we can actually take the Bible seriously again when you realize that the science is correct and that mainstream modern theoretical physics is so far beyond the realm of absurdity uh, correct or incorrect doesn't even come into question uh, when you're dealing with theoretical astrophysics People are believing in creation because they think the earth is flat. But in just a few short years, when more and more people go up there with their iPhones and live stream in ways that no one can deny, then suddenly millions of people, each and every flat earther, will have their faith crushed like a two-year-old that discovered Santa does not exist. Flat earth is the Santa Claus, hidden in disguise. It's a psyop straight out of the Illuminati card deck, and that is something you cannot deny. Well, you sure just said a mouthful, you stupid fucker. In the next few years, the next few short years, no less, when more and more people go up in space in rocket ships with their GoPro cameras and iPhones, Flat Earther's faith is going to be crushed like a two-year-old. Wow. Well, what about not in the next few short years. What about, like, right now? Uh, we certainly have the technology. Look at the go-fast rocket launch if you want to. They use a fisheye lens, so you'll probably say you see the curvature because of the fisheye lens. Uh, but you don't need to trust NASA's footage in order to detect or measure the curvature or axial rotation of the Earth. Uh, in the next few short years, they are not going to crush anyone's fantasies like a two-year-old, except for possibly yours, if you would ever participate in the scientific method and actually test the theory of heliocentrism skeptically as a rational adult, since you in fact have been tricked by Santa Globe since you were a toddler. Again. You really can't make the analogy that something is likened to Santa Claus unless it is forced upon all generations of toddlers. Now, the only difference between the globe earth lie and Santa Claus is the fact that the globe earth lie is pushed out to the entire world as scientific fact as opposed to Christians as a fun little thing to trick your children with by confusing them about the purpose of Christ's birthday that isn't even on the winter solstice, by the way, so that they can grow up sort of thinking that religion is about the same thing as Santa Claus that isn't real. In fact, the globe is exactly the same thing as Santa Claus, but about a million times worse, because again, it is an insidious plot that is willfully, knowingly, put on most generations of Christian toddlers by their very parents and the institutions sworn to educate and protect them. Now, those very same institutions also teach the globe-earth heliocentric model, and many parents teach the same. However, at least they have the plausible deniability that they were not willfully, knowingly deceiving their children in the case of the globe. For you to try to liken Flat Earth to Santa Claus is such a poor analogy, because it really has no bearing. Uh, flat earthers all grew up on quote-unquote planet Earth and understand probably a lot more than you do about the theoretical premises that support the hypothetical globe Earth model. The sad truth is we have taken this a step further and questioned an alternative hypothesis that happens to be the empirical truth. And so... I know I'm seeming redundant here, but this video sort of crawled under my skin, so hopefully this will be over soon, and I think it definitely will. Now here's where the story gets interesting. In some translations of Genesis chapter 1, we are told about the firmament, and the word firmament is being used to describe both the heavens and the earth, to hold things in place. Now remember, these ideas are being communicated to people 5,000 years ago. Genesis chapter 1 describes intelligent design with engineered evolution to people 5,000 years ago. Interesting and true. In other translations, however, firmament is referred 
referred to as the vault, like a vaulted ceiling, and that humans were created in quote unquote our image. In Genesis chapter 1, the God of Israel is described as the most powerful of his civilization. That is one of the major tenets of the Bible. You know, I really wasn't too sure where you were going with all this biblical reference, but in fact, you were going absolutely nowhere because you jumped from all of that long, drawn-out thing that you just said about biblical scriptures and such, and then completely changed the subject. You're talking about the firmament and the vault. Um, you know, I'm not sure what you're trying to prove here I, you know maybe it'd be nice if you elaborate but it really seems to me like you totally change the subject and go off into some other really bizarre sort of nonsensical tangent but let's just continue get this over with goodness if we jump forward to more modern times and apply what we know to the flat earth arguments, more scenarios come to mind. In the 1940s, it was widely reported that we shot down three interstellar craft and recovered the technology. Widely reported? Interstellar craft? What on earth are you talking about? Interstellar craft? Okay, first of all, in the heliocentric theory, the stars are trillions, hundreds of trillions of miles away, light years away, in fact, the very nearest star is supposedly four light years, and the most distant star is allegedly, uh, in terms of vis visibility, some dozens of light years, but that's sort of irrelevant. For you to say that interstellar craft landing here is some well-known thing, you're just way out in left field, brother. What are you even talking about? And what does this have to do with the curvature and axial rotation of the Earth? Seriously. Alien ships? Interstellar craft? Do you even know what interstellar means? That means they would have had to travel here from some other star. The Sirius Disclosure Project claims to have a white paper from Canadian intelligence in the 1940s stating that anti-gravity technology derived from Roswell was even more important than the development of the hydrogen bomb. It states that top U.S. scientific minds of the times, including Edward Teller, were spending more time on Roswell tech than the H-bomb. The point here, ladies and gentlemen, is what do you think the people that lost their three interstellar craft were thinking? You think they didn't notice that their crew and equipment went missing? Of course they noticed. You're joking right now, right? You're going to start, you're going to say, oh, I'm just kidding about the interstellar craft. Are you you're really going to continue running with that? <laughs> I might as well just cut this off now, but, you know, it's getting sort of interesting now that you're making a complete fool of yourself. And if you want to know what NASA and everybody else is doing with the trillions of dollars of missing money, they're building underground cities, as stated by Phil Schneider and the like, because they know an invasion is coming. <laughs> you know, that's probably the only... <laughs> That's probably the only true thing you've said this whole video. Oh my goodness. You are terrible at this. So I'm really surprised that you didn't say that uh, NASA is building bases on Mars and the moon. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> They've dead man fused every city, weaponized cell phone towers. Across the country, they put up who knows how many satellites with who knows what kind of technology from kinetic weapons to tectonic weapons and even more in anticipation of an Independence Day-like scenario. Satellites? Seriously? What in the world are you talking about, satellites? Satellites do not exist. They're unnecessary and impossible. For one thing, you know, NASA claims that their satellites are some tens of thousands of miles high, some of them. The ISS is only allegedly about 250 miles high, but NASA indeed claims to have literally tens of thousands of satellites uh, up there 
and in fact, none of those satellites exist. You see, satellites rely on a spherical Earth in the void of space-time, and the mass of the spherical Earth is warping space-time, which allows for this gravity well for the satellites to orbit in. However, the simple truth is, well, for one thing, orbital mechanics are impossible, put a card here as well, but uh, even if you could get satellites into orbit, they would be irrelevant, because you simply cannot provide enough power, the radio transmitters, and even if you could, radio frequency waves simply do not uh, propagate forever, in a vacuum even, and even if they did that, they would bounce off of the Earth's natural electromagnetic fields and ionosphere and, you know, all of the different layers of atmosphere. And so satellites are irrelevant and impotent. In fact, um, the very same ends can be achieved with high altitude geostationary weather balloons and, of course, tower based systems where you've got tower triangulation. Uh, but satellites are simply not a physical possibility because uh, the premise relies on Earth curvature, which doesn't exist, and the premise relies on gravity, which doesn't exist, and so satellites, in fact, are have been used to trick people into having to pay for services that should have been free to the public. However, unfortunately, the United States government especially tricked the world into believing that satellites were necessary to achieve ends that Nikola Tesla made available as early as the 1930s and 40s. 9-11 was staged to increase funding for those types of programs. Trillions went missing the day before 9-11, and trillions have gone missing ever since. What has this got to do with the curvature of the Earth? Um, you are talking about 9-11 as if it is somehow relevant to this conversation. Um, everybody knows that 9-11 was an inside job. However, and you know, everybody knows that the official narrative is absolutely not what's occurred. However, there's absolutely no way to prove conclusively what actually happened that day because, frankly, they did away with all of the evidence pretty much immediately after the alleged terrorist attacks. The point is, the Earth isn't going anywhere. We can all measure the Earth for curvature and axial rotation just for starters, and a lot of people are doing it, coming back with results that are categorically incompatible with the heliocentric spherical Earth model. Probability would suggest here that this is part of what they're hiding with their flat Earth psyop. The government is hiding the fact that money is disappearing after 9-11 by opening people's minds to the fact that NASA is lying and stealing our money. The Federal Reserve Bank is lying and stealing our money. The government itself is lying and stealing our money. The mainstream media is a mouthpiece for the government, and you're sitting here trying to say that Flat Earth is a diversion? For one thing, the truth can't be a diversion. Santa Claus is certainly a diversion, and that exact same thing can be perfectly analogous with Santa Claus. So it is indeed the Santa globe, not the Santa flat earth. Unless, you know, all toddlers are forced into thinking that the earth is flat without any evidence, um, that analogy doesn't hold water. Uh, only in a, you know, globe earth scenario does the Santa Claus analogy hold water. Sir, incompetence. Other evidence suggests that the invasion has begun and there's a silent war taking place right now. What do you mean by other evidence? Other evidence would imply that you had some sort of evidence to begin with. So when you say other evidence, I guess you're going to give us evidence for some alien invasion and the evidence is going to consist of you making unsubstantiated claims and maybe provide non-sequitur circumstantial evidence to support your ridiculous claims. This would explain one of the purposes of chemtrails. 
to powder the sky in a way to detect penetration of the atmosphere by radar. But the scenario might be even more dynamic than that. It could be that we're under occupation by some sort of evil empire and that some other group of interstellar beings are trying to set us free. Okay, buddy, let me put it to you this way. In the heliocentric model, interstellar travel is a theoretical impossibility because you cannot travel faster than the speed of light. And even if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take many, 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 many years to get to the nearest star with, you know, quote unquote, intelligent life, assuming your theory is correct. Now, interstellar travel would never happen in a quadrillion years truthfully in the heliocentric model in terms of non-terrestrial beings possibly visiting the world it actually becomes theoretically possible in the flat earth reality now we really don't know whether the earth has an edge or whether it continues on to infinity um, I tend to really have a hard time believing that it has an edge, although there is no proof one way or another. My reason being for that is that I realize that Earth isn't flying around through infinite space because, well, quite frankly, infinite space couldn't possibly exist. The Big Bang Theory couldn't possibly have occurred ever. Gravity is a myth. It has nothing to do with reality. Space-time is a theoretical construct that does not exist, and everything that we've been led to believe in terms of the very shape and nature of the Earth is 100% wrong. And so, with all that being said, the Earth couldn't possibly be a disk in space. The Earth is the physical plane, and the lights in the night sky are clearly not distant suns with solar systems around them. They are merely lights in the night sky which go in s perfect concentric circles around the North Pole star Polaris and the wandering stars are not terra firma planets, you know, like the Earth. There is nothing like the Earth. The Earth stands alone in the so-called universe as it is the physical plane and again, the lights in the night sky reside in the astronomical plane or the astral plane. There may be multiple levels of astral plane, although that's sort of irrelevant and impertinent, not germane to the conversation. Um, so we'll get back to your little bizarre, weird, I mean, if, if you're not talking about flat earth anymore and you're going to start talking about alien invasions and all of this you know, fear porn stuff, then I'll probably just end the video, but we'll just give it another minute. This brings us back to the moon and the lunar wave controversy. Our moon is by far the biggest in terms of moons to planet ratios. It's like one fourth the size of the earth. It's super huge and it's a mystery hiding in plain sight. Many have suggested that the moon might be a forward operating base. And most of you by now have heard of the experiments where they hit the moon with a rocket and it rang like a bell. Like a bell. Really, and did you hear it ringing like a bell? Did anyone hear it ringing like a bell? Or you heard something from NASA where they said they got it on their radio ringing like a bell? Well, just so you know, the moon allegedly exists in a near-perfect vacuum. I think it's at like 10 million particles per cubic centimeter, which is uh, a near-perfect vacuum. Um, especially compared to here on Earth. Nobody's ever hit with a rocket, nobody's ever been to the moon, and nobody's ever going. Because even NASA admits to this day that they can't get past about well, 350 miles in altitude. I submit that they don't have a single thing in orbit, and they possibly have some high flight capable planes, you know, such as U-2 style spy planes, super high altitude planes, and possibly things we've never heard of but certainly nothing akin to satellites. The ISS is faked. Spacewalks are faked underwater. Interior shots are faked on uh, Vomit Comet style, probably higher altitude, longer trajectory, and therefore longer duration. Inertially neutral environment simulation, but they also use harnesses for interior shots and of course large underwater tanks for the exterior spacewalks. So NASA's a liar. They've been a liar since day one when they 
were founded by Nazi scientists such as Werner von Braun, just to name one, although thousands of scientists were smuggled over through uh, Project Paperclip and others that were not acknowledged and we'll probably never know about, but uh, it was more than just one or two people at NASA were Nazis and founders and spearheaded the program after World War II uh, without the American people's consent or knowledge, without the knowledge and consent of Congress or the House. So wake up out there. We're not pushing this issue to piss people off. We're pushing the issue to get people to think beyond the psyop. Yes, they're hiding something. Yes, you're on the right track. But it's our best assertion that it isn't a flat earth they're trying to hide. It's something much more nefarious than that. That video of Miley Cyrus is fake. If you can't tell that's fake, you seriously need to get your eyes checked because that is obvious CGI. Keep pushing the envelope. Keep pushing the horizon. Something else is going on. Let me ask you, does anyone else see that in the sky? How the sky has got a perfectly straight line all the way through it? One side is dark blue. And one side is light blue. Is anybody else seeing that? It's a perp. Well, that's really uh, about the end of Ron Johnson's absolutely ridiculous video. So thank goodness that's over. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I was actually rolling on the floor laughing there for a little bit, so uh, hopefully you guys will get a little bit of uh, joy out of it <laughs> as I did. Um, by the way, if you'd like to support the channel, you could do so. Direct link to www.paypal.me slash themorgyle1 or directly through PayPal to jonelance at gmail.com. Uh, thanks so much, you guys. God bless. Spread the word. Spread the world in peace. Earth game. Okay, the Earth happens to be a stationary plane. If you can prove curvature and axial rotation, then you can debunk the flat Earth. Until then, you have nothing, and your arguments are just so far in the realm of skullduggery, it's preposterous. Furthermore, if you can disprove the data on the Facebook page, $5,000 NASA Eclipse Challenge, then guess what? You can win 5,000 bucks. All you have to do is disprove the uh, data that is cataloged very easily to understand by uh, my friend Brian, who's a civil engineer. Unfortunately, it's been up for over a year now and nobody's been able to claim the prize because uh, unfortunately you can't debunk facts. And this is just, you know, yet another fact involving solar and lunar eclipses that are physically impossible on a spherical Earth model and jive perfectly with a flat Earth reality. Just like everything else, if you would bother to open your eyes to the truth, if for no other reason than for argument's sake, it's not going to hurt you or kill you to humor theories that happen to differ from your accepted paradigm. In fact, the only outcome to such bizarre behavior that is essentially the scientific method is to further understand the truth, if not by process of elimination, but by confirming what you already know to be true, or what you already think you know to be true. 
Before continuing, we would just like you to accept the fact that there is a Flat Earth card in the Illuminati card deck, and that other explanations for what is being observed are possible. For example, this clip from ODD TV. Plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to be to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building. Something being in the Illuminati card game proves that it's a PSYOP. Uh, is really quite ridiculous. I suppose that we can conclude that NASA is faking space and faking the uh, very Apollo missions and the blue marble sort of uh, Earth in the background there based on your theory that the Illuminati card game is somehow an infallible source of truth. Sure, there do seem to be some sort of eerie predictions that you can uh, possibly connect dots to and see that they've occurred in the future but you know things like oil spill and terrorist attack and gas attack and you know these aren't things that were totally a hundred percent fabricated I mean these are known threats these are known things that happen now whether or not the elite are using this game as a playbook whether the playbook is prophetic or it could be you know some pretty serious coincidences in a lot of cases. I mean, I have seen some things in the Illuminati card game that really do sort of make you scratch your head and wonder how they could have gotten certain things really quite technically uh, accurate to what's occurred in reality uh, beyond the possibility of sheer coincidence, which leads me to believe, you know, there may be some rich, powerful people playing this game, or it could be somewhat prophetic. Um, anyway, I'm not going to, you know, hold too much weight on something that is on an Illuminati card because, you know, unfortunately, Ron Johnson, and I'm sorry for calling you a globetard, that was rude. The, the sad fact is the Earth isn't a spinning sphere, and this has been proven, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different ways. Um, furthermore all physical experiments that you can do in order to prove whether or not the Earth is spherical and spinning and orbiting and all of that, um, all of the, the such experiments come back with results that are null. In other words, the Earth is a stationary plane, quite the contrary to a spinning sphere, in fact. Truthers play the 9-11 truth card while the Illuminati plays the flat earth card, effectively dividing those attempting to resist the tyranny. The Illuminati plays the flat earth game? What kind of ridiculous shit is that, man? The Illuminati plays the flat What's up guys, John the Morgyle here, going to do a video response to Globetard, Ron Johnson. So, I hope all you guys are having a blessed day on the static plane Earth. Let's just jump right on into it, because this one has got some shit coming. Firstly, everyone should be aware that the Flat Earth appears in the Illuminati card game, and it's there because it's a massive psyop. A couple of my subscribers have complained that I interrupt my uh, response videos too much, and I, I am sorry, but this is the most efficient, effective way for me to respond to the claims made in such videos, as they are done in sort of a rapid-fire succession so that people don't really have a chance to think about them much. Uh, but I just wanted to address that, that I did hear at least two people uh, make this sort of, uh, you know, constructive criticism on the Neil deGrasse video, which I did recently. I'll put a card right here, uh, in case you haven't seen it. But, um, 
you know, the only other way I know to do this would be to like list out the claims made by the uh, globe tart here and then do all of my rebuttals at the end. But, you know, it would sort of be out of context and this is the, you know, best way that I know how to do it in order to keep the rebuttals in context. So, in terms of the claim made by the globe tart here, um, he's essentially saying that Flat Earth is a PSYOP and the proof is that it is in the Illuminati card game. Now, the card actually says Flat Earthers may know something. Da -da 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 -da. And it's considered a fringe group in the game. I've never played the game. I've never really been into, uh, you know, childish things like that. Some people may be, but yeah, I was not like a Pokemon kid or, you know, a garbage pail card kid or whatever. I don't know. I never even really got into comics, but, you know, to say that dead in the water because they've been caught red handed. Uh, lying, faking spacewalks, faking interiors of the ISS, and this isn't some sort of breadcrumb trail. This is researchers catching NASA uh, filming spacewalks in underwater pools. Other evidence that you'll see on ODD and the like includes video footage from the edge of the atmosphere showing what appears to be a flat world. The truth of the matter is that given the size of the planet, you would have to be much further away from the Earth to see the curvature than these weather experiments can provide. Really, is that so? And is that why globe heads claim that they can see ships going over the horizon? in just a few miles. What about when you get over 100,000 feet in altitude and the horizon level doesn't drop, as it should where the Earth is sphere? Why can we see that the sun is clearly local, casting a hot spot directly on the clouds beneath it? That should not happen if the sun was 93 million miles away. The simple fact is, is high altitude shots should indeed show curvature. Globeheads even argue they can see curvature from the top of a mountain or out of a plane window, but you're saying that from over 100,000 feet that, that isn't high enough. Although, standing at sea level, you claim to be able to see ships going over the horizon. Now, of course, ships going over the horizon is an operation of perspective, has nothing to do with going over a curve, and you'll probably have to uh, watch some of my older videos or plenty of other uh, Flat Earthers videos going into the operations of perspective and how that makes distant objects obviously appear to get smaller and smaller, more so the closer they are to your line of sight. So, the top of a mast of a ship is more distant from your line of sight than the hull, therefore it will be visible for a longer period beyond the horizon line, and it will appear to continue to get smaller and smaller as it goes beyond your uh, horizon line. That gives the optical illusion of it going over a curve, however if you zoom back in on the very same ship that has appeared to go over the horizon or merge with the horizon bottom first, and zoom in on it, you will clearly see it's going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Multiple government outlets have leaked this information on purpose because they want you to follow the breadcrumbs back to the outlets that cover this propaganda. Wait a minute, so you're insinuating that the government wants to get caught stealing 20 billion dollars a year just in tax dollars for NASA? You're insinuating that NASA wants to get caught faking space? and faking the moon landings, which indeed they have been 100% certainly. <laughs>
In this clip, you heard exactly what they wanted you to hear. And in these other clips, you're seeing exactly what they want you to see. And while it points towards mass deception, what it might suggest is mass deflection. You're making absolutely no sense, and I don't care how much scary music you play in the background and use big words and seemingly profound statements that make really absolutely no sense whatsoever. That doesn't score any points uh, with anybody who's really looking into this logically, I would hope. There are no accidents in politics. That's poli sci 101. NASA has nothing to do with politics. NASA is an arm of the U.S. military. It is a government agency, but it is not political in the slightest, other than the fact that they do get U.S. tax dollars, right? But to claim that NASA wants to be caught faking space and is going to do anything but continue deceiving people and as cheaply as possible, they really don't have to try that hard, to be honest. They've got an extremely large budget to do this sort of thing with, but most people already believe everything NASA says, including really quite ridiculous animations of the moon from a million miles away or whatever like you're seeing here. But NASA is completely 